Hi, I'm Dr. Caroline Leaf and welcome to my podcast. Each week I focus on topics related to mental health and discuss ways to help you deal with issues like anxiety, depression, shame, guilt, PTSD and more. I've spent the last 30 years researching the mind-brain connection and mental health. I worked with patients who suffered from traumatic brain injuries, struggled with anxiety, battled with learning issues, and often worked with families to resolve major relationship and communication problems. In this podcast, you will hear the advice I gave to my patients and the techniques I developed and used to help them find healing. My goal is to give you simple, effective and practical tips and tools to help you take back control over your mental, emotional and physical health. Before I begin today's discussion, I want to just take a moment to thank everyone who has supported this podcast either by leaving a review, spreading the word, sharing episodes with friends and family, and posting about this podcast on social media. I love reading your reviews and learning how I can make this podcast even more helpful. Like this review from a listener. I have battled mental illness for 20 years and was thrown into the psychiatric system when I was a young high school girl fighting for my sanity. At my worst, I was on at least seven different psychotropic medications to cope with daily life. Over the past two years, I have been on a healing journey to find holistic and alternative solutions to get to the root of my symptoms and become the wife, mother, friend, and individual God has called me to be in this world. Dr. Leaf's work is validating, empowering, inspiring, and practical that will make all the difference in your life. Thank you for your courageous calling, Dr. Leaf. Keep spreading this valuable message. Thank you so much. And now back to today's podcast. Today, I'm going to discuss how to argue correctly and the benefits of arguing correctly for our mental health and relationships. I grew up in a family where things were kind of swept under the rug. And this led to, as you can imagine, a lot of undealt with stuff in between myself and my siblings. And our parents definitely caused a lot of relationship issues that definitely, even as much as we loved each other, definitely persisted into adulthood. And it's really only as adults that we've managed to resolve a lot of these things. And this could have been done so many years ago if I had applied what I'm teaching you today. In fact, if all of us in my family had applied that. So I've brought my family up on these rules and try to apply them as much as I can in my life. It is very common actually amongst family and friends to have arguments and it does really cause more problems in the long run if you don't learn how to argue properly. Learning how to argue can be one of the most beneficial skills that it can actually improve not only relationships but also your mental health. So let's dive in and explore how to argue correctly. So we're going to talk about the six points of arguing and then I'm going to talk about the benefits of doing of applying these six rules of arguing in your life for your mental health and relationships and your brain health and your body health. So these are things that I really suggest that you learn, memorize, practice using because every argument that you go into, this is the model that you would draw on. This is how you can do the arguing so that you're more successful in having a successful argument. So the first thing is perceptions. Perceptions. What are you perceiving? Before you just respond or snap or get irritated or be reactive or get upset, make sure you understand what the other person means. So simple. Ask for clarification before reacting, especially if you feel triggered by what they're saying. Try and kind of say what they've said Again, so restate their statement or ask them to restate their statement just to see that you understand each other. Do this as calmly as you can. So what you're trying to do is see it from their angle. I'm sure you've heard the statement. Assumptions are the mother of all mess-ups. Don't assume you know what the other person is thinking because it's absolutely impossible. There is a 70% chance that your assumption is wrong. 
and if you don't know the person at all, pretty much 100%. I'll give you an example. I've been married for 30 years. I've known my husband, Nick, for 31 years. And we still have to practice applying these rules. And when we don't, and Max says something to trigger me, and this happened just a couple of days ago, he said, and instead of me getting clarification, I snapped and got irritated. And we ended up having a little tiff and wasted time. And once we had calmed down and we actually saw what we were trying to say to each other, it kind of diffused the whole situation. But we can be proactive in this. So if we plan on arguing in this way, in a good, in applying all these rules, it can make it so much more effective. So what I should have done was taken a few breaths, asked Matt what he meant, or paraphrase back what he was saying to see if I understood, and then taken it further. If you do that, it will completely transform how you respond and how your relationships grow in the future. The second thing is grace. We really need to give each other more grace. Give people a chance. Maybe they're having a bad day. Maybe they're feeling horrible. Maybe they're tired. Maybe something else has happened that's going on in their life that's maybe making them a little distracted and this, they didn't really come into this argument or you know, fully in their best mental state. Always try to see the best first. Try to see why that person maybe is upset. Look at the context. That is an attitude thing. Grace is an attitude. So it's an attitude of I'm always going to see the best first. I'm always going to look at the context. I'm not going to take the snapping or the irritation or the harsh words or whatever it is as, as a negative thing. I'm going to see it that there's a reason behind this. That shift in your attitude changes the way that you generate energy from your brain. So instead of it being toxic energy that literally hits that person like little, a little BB gun, and this is real energy that hits the person, it's rather a more gentle, loving kind of energy that will will hit the person in a good way and that can really help to diffuse a potentially explosive situation. Third thing, self-reflection. Maybe you hurt that person. Maybe you said things in the past and your response is their trigger. Maybe the content of the discussion of the argument is something that revolves around hurt that happened in the past between you. Another thing with self-reflection is Are you looking at the person through their past mistakes? I know I have done that with Matt. I have done that with my children. I've done that with my friends. And I'm pretty certain you have. For example, in the past when when Matt and I used to have arguments, he used to kind of look like he was not concentrating. He'd look away or not look at me. And it used to cause a lot of irritation. I used to have to really get his attention, especially when he was distracted with some other work. And over the years, we've obviously dealt with that. But every now and then, he'll get a certain look on his face. And that's a trigger for me to think, okay, he's not listening. So I will, in a kind of a snappy way, say, you're not listening. Because what I've just done is looked at him through the eyes of the past, how he was. But he's changed that. So when I say that kind of thing, you're not listening, he'll turn around and say, but I am. We've discussed this before. I've changed. I am listening. I'm just focusing differently. I don't have to look at you to focus or something like that. So I've got to be careful that I don't bring past mistakes into the present. We all have to be. We've got to be very careful that we don't don't literally crucify people through the eyes of the past. Remember, people are always evolving. Remember that you want to get the grace that you're giving. So self-reflection helps you to basically see people through the eyes of change, through the attempts that they've made to change. Remember, the past doesn't define the future. Just because someone's done it in the past many times and they're trying to get out of it, it doesn't mean they're always going to be like that. But we are all going to fall at times. So if you see someone has been changing, you need to acknowledge that. And let's say, for example, Mac was distracted and didn't really listen to me. And he said, sorry, I forgot for a moment. I need to give him the grace because how he was in the past doesn't define the current argument or the future arguments. Also ask yourself why questions in the self-reflection. Why are you doing this? Why is that person doing this? You can't answer their questions, but you certainly can try to get into their shoes. Though asking the why questions prompts you to remember that there's always a reason why each of us do do what we do. And we don't always know it until we get into these situations where we are actually arguing or discussing things. Another thing in this self-reflection is let go of your ego. 
Don't be proud, prideful. Pride is not going to help you. It makes you defensive. It makes you angry. It makes you very difficult to connect with. Vulnerability and humility are always so much better to have a so much better to embed a conversation in. And in terms of the brain science and quantum physics science, when you are letting go of your ego and pride, you also generate a love wave as opposed to a very BB gun bullet type of energy wave at that person, which the person feels. Before we continue, I want to take a quick break and tell you about and invite you to my 2019 Mental Health Summit in Dallas, Texas, December 6 and 7. In this conference, you'll learn scientifically researched mental self-care techniques to help you overcome mental ill health, help others, and help your community. You will not only gain more knowledge about the current problems in mental health care, but also about real, long-term, sustainable solutions, and how to apply these solutions in your own life and in your community. In this summit, you will learn how to overcome mental health issues like anxiety and depression, learn how to help children and teens, learn correct nutrition and exercise to boost your mental health, learn how to identify and define your unique identity based on neuroscientific research, learn how to improve memory, learn how to help family members and loved ones who struggle with mental ill health, learn how to avoid burnout and manage stress, Learn how to deal with disappointment. Learn how to overcome intrusive and chaotic thinking. And so much more. For more information and to register, go to drleafconference.com. One last thing before we get back to this week's podcast. I want to give a big thank you to everyone who has donated so far to my research project fundraiser. So far, we have raised over 41,000 out of our 120,000 goal. 100% of these funds are going directly to this project. And so far, we have used what we have raised to pay lab technicians, research design, pre-test statistical analysis, and more. The results from this research project and clinical trials will help us make mental health care more accessible, affordable, and applicable for people all around the world. Please keep sharing the word about this project with friends and family. For more information on this project and to donate, visit drleafresearch.com. Fourth point, watch your verbal and nonverbal communication. So watch what you're saying. Be careful of sweeping statements like, You always do this. You never do that. Those are real trigger words. Choose what you're going to say. Choose your words carefully. Choose them very carefully. And watch how you use those words to construct your sentences. And also consider your body language. Nonverbal communication is 50% of communication. So the way you're feeling will light up your eyes in a certain way, will make the muscles around your eyes move in a certain way, will make the muscles around your mouth move in a certain way, will make your body muscles tense up in a certain way. And all of that, other people are picking up. Even if you think you're hiding it, you're not. So we need to be very careful of our verbal and nonverbal communication, which really does mean that we need the prior step of self-reflection, because self-reflection also enables us to stand outside and observe our own thinking, feeling, choosing, and that nonverbal communication. Point five, action. Resolve to acknowledge your role and responsibility up front. So the action that you're going to take is to resolve and acknowledge your role, your responsibility. Be very prepared to give a genuine, authentic apology, not just a quick, meaningless sorry to kind of try to diffuse the situation. This is, is an action step because you're doing something. You're choosing to see that you play a role. Communication takes two people. Don't just try and diffuse a situation or turn it away from the current issue by just throwing out a sorry. If you're going to say sorry, make sure it's a very genuine, authentic apology that is growth and action orientated, moving forward orientated. Really make the attempt to change your behavior so that the other person can see this in ensuing discussions and arguments. 
So you always need to be action solution oriented. So in the case of maybe my discussions with Mac, I could give you another example. When we start talking in business and things start getting heated, both of us have trained ourselves to to be very aware of, okay, this is a this is a time where we need to be very we need to bring those actions of our previous arguments that we've learned from, of what not to do, into play. That we're going to acknowledge, both of us are going to do the self-reflection and do these whole things, all these steps to make sure that we go into that argument more effectively. I have to admit there are times we don't, and there are times that we uh, fall and have an argument. But what I'm excited about and excited to share with you is that as we apply these all the time, very deliberately, steps deliberately and intentionally, our arguing skills have improved dramatically. Our arguments are less, less heated and finish way quicker than they used to and always end with something really constructive and growth focused with a real desire to to reconnect and, and our love just grows. The relationship improves. It's very beneficial when you start experiencing these arguing properly skills in your life. It's very exciting. Point number six, argument autopsy. Such an important skill. So now the argument's over, everything's resolved, and you feel great and happy. And then two hours later or 24 hours later, you find yourself back in an argument about something the same or very similar. And you think, why? Just like yesterday we managed this. Why are we doing this again? Well, it's probably because you didn't do an argument autopsy. You always need to do an argument autopsy. So once you're both calm, once you solve the whole thing, and it may be more than one person that's involved in an argument. This is not necessarily, um, these are not necessarily point skills that you need to only apply between two people. It could be a group of people. But it's really important when the argument's over, you're all calm and you're all friendly, that you say, okay, so guys, this is what we argued about. These are the misperceptions about each other. How can we prevent how can we prevent this in future? And as we as you do that, like make a constructive point of discussing that, maybe even make some notes, maybe even keep a little log of the typical things that you have an argument of, like in your business or in your with your spouse or with your kids or with your friends, because the same things tend to come up all the time. So write it down, jot it down and do that argument or topsy and maybe even record how many times you used to do it and you'll see that it over time as you apply these principles. It gets less and less, which is very encouraging. So we need to learn from the above process. Don't just move on or the same thing will happen again. Use the argument or topsy as a preventative measure. Use this to understand how not to do this in the future. And just remember, as you are trying not to do it, you probably will do it, but it will get less and less. So give yourself grace in the process. Discuss with the other person what can be done in the future to prevent or to manage a reoccurrence of the exact same argument. The mental autopsy will give you those details, those triggers, those situations, those contexts. But if you don't do the mental the argument autopsy, you won't get that. You see, the point is to keep progressing forward in your mental health and your relationship. Let's briefly talk about the benefits of arguing correctly. First of all, you are preventing building up a toxic thought in your brain. And as you know, from all the discussions and teachings and materials and books that I have, when you have a toxic thought, it causes brain damage. And that brain damage is going to cause neurochemical chaos. And that brain damage from that toxic thought is going to affect all the cells of your body and make you feel awful. That brain, that toxic thought is going to feed back into your mind. Remember, your mind is not your brain. Your mind moves through your brain. Your brain responds to your mind. So the thought that you've built up in your brain, this toxic thought, is going to also feed back into your mind and cause mind fog. You're not going to have wisdom. Clear thinking, and that can lead into more arguments and snowball into a whole bad day with one thing after another going badly. Second thing, you need to choose how you want to spend your energy. There's a limit to how much energy you have in a day, and that's why we go to sleep at night, so we can you know, get our energy back, and why we need to have times where we think during the day and just switch off and daydream to give our brain a rest. Your energy is limited and you need to decide on whether you want to go down the toxic route of arguing in the incorrect way, which drains your energy terribly because toxic energy is very energy hungry. And then it doesn't leave enough energy for the good stuff in the rest of your day. So when you rehash a pattern, when you rehash something toxic, you're actually draining, rehashing in, in the sense of not progressing forward, not making it 
a positive um, changing it and, and improving it. If you just rehash and go over and over and over how that person's bad and how you've been hurt and all those wrong things, you are draining your energy and you're going to make yourself feel horrible and you're draining the energy out of your body. Your blood flow even changes, your blood chemistry changes. Or you can move your energy into building this healthy response based on getting to the root of the issue and improving your relationship and your communication in general. The the steps I just described on how to argue correctly are going to help you use your energy correctly. Third thing, third benefit, assumptions create a feeling of anger and irritation, which are related very much to how much to the energy point I just made. It takes a huge amount of toxic energy, very draining, and it creates tremendous chemical chaos. Assumptions are the mother of all mess-ups. Be so careful of assumptions. Be very aware and self-regulate whether you are a person that tends to make assumptions. We all make assumptions, all of us. But as we can self, as we learn to self-regulate more, we can reduce the amount of assumptions we make. Assumptions are really strong triggers for getting into arguments. Point four: Don't suppress a toxic thought. That toxic thought has got a very weird protein and chemical structure in the brain that is creating tremendous chaos in the brain. The body recognizes this like a body recognizes a virus or a, any kind of other physical damage. So a toxic thought is the equivalent of physical damage in the brain and body, and it alerts your immune system. And if you don't deal with something, your immune system just keeps going and going and going, and this can create an autoimmune response, which can affect your mind and body health. Don't suppress. You've got to deal with your stuff. Point number five. One hour of arguing properly may save you years of relationship problems. That is a very wise and profound statement. Take the time, as painful as it is and as frustrating as it is, to learn to argue properly. Take this podcast, learn these skills, and apply it. This may save you years of relationship problems. Benefit number six. You're never, you're never going to really learn or grow if you don't fight through problems. You're never going to grow in your relationship and even in yourself. You're not going to evolve in yourself if you don't deal with issues. You're in a world. You're not alone. It's not about you. It's about you in the world. You're entangled. You're connected, whether you like it or not. So if you're going to improve in your deep, meaningful relationships, which you need to survive, you need to argue properly. Point number seven. I've said this a few times and I'm going to stress it again. Learn these rules. Use them immediately when you begin to argue with anyone. So in closing, don't fear arguments, but don't stay in them for long. You now have some rules to help you learn how to argue correctly and the benefits. Don't let your ego rule. Don't think you know everything. Don't be the know-it-all. Don't be prideful. We all argue. We all make mistakes. We all make assumptions. But we can certainly get better at managing this. Don't forget to do your autopsies, your argument autopsies, to analyze them and learn from them. Remember, one hour of arguing properly may save you years of relationship problems and give you wonderful mental health. If you are interested in learning more about how you can improve your mental health, be sure to visit my website at drleaf.com and to sign up for my weekly newsletter where I also include a schedule of my speaking events and so much more. Thank you for joining me today. I really hope you learned something new and helpful. Be sure to leave me a review and tune in next week. Till then... I'm Dr. Caroline Leaf.